Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to What's New in Historical Fiction, a regular panel series that features historical novelists with new and upcoming titles. I'm so glad you could be here, and I'm so excited to talk to these great authors about their, their new novels. My name is Colin Mustful. I'm the founder and editor of History Through Fiction, and uh, we publish we're an independent press out of Minneapolis, Minnesota that publishes historical novels. And, and so it's always really fun for me to talk to other authors, other historical novelists about their books and about their work and to be able to share it with our audience. Um, so I'm so glad you could join us. Uh, just a few things, if you're not familiar with uh, the Zoom platform, um, I put it so that all of you are just um, watching, so you won't be able to unmute yourself or open up your cameras, but you can interact via the chat. So on the bottom of the screen, you should find a button to open up the chat. So please go ahead and say hello. Let us know where you're joining us from. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, during the event, please feel free to interact there on the chat. Any thoughts that come up, anything that you can relate to that our, our panelists are talking about. And um, with about 15 minutes left in the event, um, this will be a 60 minute event at about 745 Central Time. I'll open it up to questions from the audience. So at that time, I'll let you know and you can post your question there in the chat and I'll just try to moderate that the best I can. Um, aside from that, um, oh, I do have a link for everyone that you can go to to find our panelists' novels. So I put together a landing page there with each of our panelists' novels. So if you wanna check those out, there's also links on there where you can go and buy the books. I've got to send a couple to bookshop.org because um, we like to support bookshop.org. They give a percent of their proceeds back to independent booksellers, and they also give us a small commission. So if you buy from bookshop.org, you're supporting the author, you're supporting the bookseller, and you're supporting an independent press history through fiction. Finally, I do want to thank anyone who contributed financially to attend the event today. It is a free event and I want to be able to keep it free, but there are costs of using Zoom and Eventbrite. And so I really appreciate anyone that was able to give a small amount in order to um, be a part of this event tonight. Okay, without further ado, let's bring, let's talk to our panelists. I'm going to go to the top of the screen here and unpin myself. So first, uh, let's welcome Amanda Barrett, author of The Warsaw Sisters. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Amanda, could you just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your novel? Absolutely. So my novel, The Warsaw Sisters, released November 7th, and it is the story of twin sisters in World War II era Warsaw and their individual journeys of resistance and resilience. I was really privileged to be able to explore so many fascinating events and facets of Poland's history in the novel, such as the dairy network of women who rescued hundreds of Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto and Poland's secret army that rose up in 1944 in a heroic and tragic battle for the city's freedom. And at its heart, this is a story about women. It's a story about women forged by war, the power of women in these midst of this darkness and the enduring bonds of sisters. Yeah, it's really amazing history. Um, you, you, The video uh, was kind of freezing. Hopefully that works things out. You, the sound quality was great, so that's good. Um, so I apologize. Uh, to anyone watching that if the if their video quality if it was kind of freezing um but anyways i'm really excited to talk to you more about your novel the warsaw sisters uh selena if you could introduce yourself and tell us about your novel hi everyone i'm glad to be here um my novel is called the line of splendor a novel of nathaniel green and the american revolution i uh have a four book historical fantasy series on the American Revolution and General Green was in three of those books. Once that was published, I decided to write a biographical novel just about him. He was uh, George Washington's most trusted and capable general of the Revolutionary War. Um, he served in all kinds of capacity, quartermaster general, commander of the Southern Army. And he was a, a national hero that a lot of people don't know about uh, don't know about him in detail so I wanted to bring this wonderful general to the forefront in my in my novel so that people could get to know him besides you know the usual guys like George Washington 
Yeah, I think that's great. Um, I honestly, until I learned about your novel, I did not know anything about Nathaniel Green. Uh, let's welcome Imogen Martin, author of To the Wild Horizon, and she's joining us all the way from the UK today, so she stayed up late for us. <laughs> Hello, and it's it's lovely to be here. Um, so my book is, as you said, to the world horizon, and it will be published by Storm in exactly one week's time on the 7th of February. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and it's the pioneer story. So it's the story of, of Grace, who um, shoots her landlord and isn't sure whether she's uh, killed him or not. And she has to make sure that uh, she is safe and more importantly, her little brother is safe. And they have been planning to go on the Oregon Trail uh, to meet up with their elder brother. Um, and so it's how she manages to get onto the first train out there, which she needs to do. Uh, she can only do that by lying to get herself on it. Um, but, and it's it's really, it's a, a love story um, at its heart. Um, in some ways, Elizabeth and Darcy from Pride and Prejudice, but in the Wild West. That's a fun way to put it. Thank you, Imogen. Uh, and finally, uh, one of my favorite people, uh, Angie uh, Newell. Um, now I can't remember your Angie Alita Newell uh, with All I See is Violence. Why don't you tell us about yourself and your novel? I'm originally from Fort Simpson in the Northwest Territories. I belong to the Dene Nation and I'm Lidley Q. And I'm trained as a historian and I wrote a dramatic retelling Maybe, I guess I'd say dramatic retelling of the Battle of Little Bighorn. And we've, um, I wove three different perspectives General Custer with the female warrior Little Wolf. And then we go to the 1970s with Nancy Swift Fox, who's her relation. And it sort of interties that, you know, these historical issues are pertinent and they still are affecting Indigenous communities today. And you had me at Pride and Prejudice. I love that book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Angie. Yes. Um, as long as you've just introduced your book, let's let's stick with you. Uh, I'm curious to know, you're writing about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, which has kind of worked its way into popular culture. So what we know about it today is can be relative, can be kind of skewed. So can you talk about portraying the battle in your novel and what are some of those some of the myths or some of the things that have worked their way into pop culture that you think readers don't quite understand about the realities of that event i'm originally from northern canada and so you know being born and raised in canada and i'm a millennial like i actually had no idea about the battle of little bighorn and so i came across custer's memoirs when I was, um, so how my, how this started was I was at a Musqueam feast and this Cheyenne elder just said to me, you know, there was once female warriors and, you know, this had hadn't been, you know, I hadn't found this in my historical research, my archival research before. And I started looking into it and he was right. And there I found custard and my life on the plains. And I read this, I was like, holy smokes, like this is like a Shakespearean tragedy and what a narcissist. And so I, you know, I just like, that was, it was totally new to me. So I didn't have that sort of American historical imprinting because we learned about different things in Canada, like um, lots of stuff about beaver fur. <laughs> That's like one area of indigenous. Like, was there anything outside of the beaver fur trade? Or <laughs> and so for for me, I wanted to um, I really wanted to bring it to life. What the indigenous the the indigenous experience would have been for that. But I found I couldn't get as many historical facts or the sort of like paradigm contradictions without having Custer, and he was just such a fabulous, you know, like grandiose sort of being. Like it's very very inspirational as an artist well it's interesting to hear you talk about it as a canadian um because my perspective is as an american and and yeah we we just get short bits of it but it's it's always kind of there and and yeah with um custer as well you know he's kind of grown to be bigger than the history itself well, like his, well, he was at Battle of Gettysburg, like his Civil War, you know, resume was pretty impressive. Like this was a seasoned fighter. This They didn't just send, you know, some green person straight out of, you know, the, you know, 
West Point Hall into the plains like that, like this person was experienced. He had like at least 20 years of fighting under his belt by the time he got there, 15 years, like it's, so mm -hmm. I mean, I, I can see why there's like historical importance. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to victimize it or like make him like the big, you know, big bad Custer either. Like, I think, I think, you know, I, I remember we spoke about this, like history is very gray. <laughs> They're like, oh, good, bad. Like, oh, it's pretty like mixed mm -hmm. motives and, you know, why people did what they did and the responses that that generated. And I think at the end of the day, the biggest lesson we can all learn is war. Nobody wins. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's go to Amanda, um, and she has the Warsaw Sisters and dealing with World War II, but uh, I actually want to talk about your characters, Antonina and Helena, the Warsaw Sisters themselves. What were the actions that they took to defend themselves and others from Nazi occupation at that time? That is such a great question. So my character Antonina becomes involved in a network of women that rescued Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto and sheltered them in their homes outside the city. And together, this dauntless group of women save hundreds, if not the network that they work with actually saved 2,500 children. So that's absolutely remarkable. And so I really wanted to explore um, their stories and the name of Irena Sendler, who was one of the women, her story has really become legendary. She didn't do it alone, did it alongside a courageous fraternity of main women. So it's women who are basically risking their lives. The penalty was execution at the time, and yet they continue to risk it. And then my character of Helena works with the Polish underground and what became known as the Home Army that rose up in this heroic and tragic 63-day battle. And there were women, there were women working in the resistance, there were women fighting in the uprising, they were couriers and nurses and combatants, and they suffered and they sacrificed as soldiers. And the stories are extraordinarily compelling, but they've also been often forgotten, especially in North America. So I really was so privileged to be able to bring their stories out of the shadows in this novel. Yeah, that really is quite amazing. And um, I do want to ask you more about kind of bringing them out of the shadows. Um, but before I do, let's um, move on here to Selena. And you kind of do the same thing, bringing forth a, a lesser known history that not a lot of people know about in Nathaniel Green. So can you tell us about Major Nathaniel Green and why why has his role in the American Revolution been overshadowed? Well, he was actually a major general, uh, not a major. I think that his uh, role in the revolution was overshadowed. He was, uh, first of all, I think Washington overshadowed him. He was only second in command to Washington. Washington was the only general that outranked Nathaniel Green. And um, I think also people, a lot of people who don't know about the Revolutionary War uh, identify with Washington or Lafayette or Thomas Jefferson, somebody who's like more in the public eye. Nathaniel Green fought the entire Revolutionary War. He uh, served as quartermaster general. He commanded the Southern Army. And he is the one that drove the British out of the Carolinas to their surrender at Yorktown. And people don't know this. Uh, what he sacrificed, he actually sacrificed his own fortune to clothe his troops in the Carolinas. And uh, people don't know what he sacrificed because I think he died of sunstroke when he was uh, 43. And so he didn't get a chance to go on and be a founding father or, or part of the new government in the, in the United States of America. So I think he was forgotten. And his story is amazing, the battles he fought and the things he did. And his wife, Katie, also has a point of view in the novel. And she, after Nathaniel died, she helped Eli Whitney invent the cotton gin. And so her story in itself is pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's quite a story and, and good for you for you know, bringing it forward for people. Well, let's go to Imogen. Uh, Imogen, you don't have any wars in your in your novel, uh, and you even talked about a little bit of romance. Uh, so tell us about your main character, Grace, and what challenges she faces. 
So, yes, by at the time when the novel starts, she has, uh, say, an elder brother who has been one of the very first pe uh, pioneers who went across the, the continent. Um, and her parents have both died of uh, cholera and it has been her intention to get across. And she has letters. And one of the things which interested me was that, that letters did make their way back a, a, across in the 1840s, uh, that they would um, get you know, you've still got some of these um, in museums and they would get passed from place to place and you have all these different sort of handwriting on them. And so uh, she's planning to go there with her brother, but wanting to wait until a better time in the season. But as I say, she um, has defended herself. She doesn't think anybody's going to believe her. And so she is the she needs to get out of town as fast as possible. Um, and the person in charge of the train is uh, the, the captain, Captain Randolph, won't let women travel alone, which is a perfectly sensible position. Um, actually, a lot of the, the book is sort of about the misogyny of the time. Um, and he is miso uh, a misogynist. That is, and that's something which uh, is his, his growth point. Uh, but actually, his basic position actually is fairly sensible. Um, but nevertheless, so she has to lie in order to get onto the, the train. And so then it's the, the challenges that she has. And then she has to try to prove herself as she's going across uh, all the different challenges they had of the, the rivers and the, yeah, all, all of all of what goes with with trying to do a two thousand mile journey in six months in a in a wagon. We'll talk more about that. What you know, I so I grew up in the late eighties, early nineties, and there was a game at that time called the Oregon Trail. And they, <laughs> they used to stick us in the computer lab, and all I know is that Tommy died of cholera and dysentery. Surely it was dysentery. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So what uh, what did you learn about that the challenges of traveling along the Oregon Trail um that you know that are real versus what we see in TV and games? Well, I, I think well one of the things was that um people walked most of the way. Um you know, our our images are all created by I think by Hollywood films. Well, that's that's certainly for me. It's it's all <laughs> maybe I'm too old for the for the games, but <laughs> um and and so we have these pictures in our heads, don't we? And um but no, so so that was the first thing was that actually they, they walked most of most of the way. Uh that the wagons were so uncomfortable that you tried not to, to sit on it. Um Gosh, um, uh, that and uh, I have to say, I'm very interesting that uh, interested that we've got Angie here as well because one of the points in this is about how much of the Native American story I was able to bring in, particularly as a, a white British person. Um, but certainly, there was a huge fear of the Native American threat and a huge amount of racism, but it's actually, it was something which happened extremely rarely. But again, you wouldn't believe that from watching Hollywood films. But uh, so it's, it's, so there are all those sort of, um, and I think also by that stage, there were quite a lot of people doing it, going out there. Um, I, I was, I wanted to try, try to have the, the year I set it in as late as possible. Uh, to have it sort of normalized. I didn't want it to be from um, 1849 after the gold rush, because that's another thing, is the big change between what the experience was like before the gold rush and what it was like after that, that the nature of the people who were traveling changed. Um, so before that, there were mostly sort of middle-class farming families, because if you were really doing well, yeah, you know, on the yeah you know, the the eastern side. Uh, well, you just stay there. You were doing fine. Um, if you were weren't doing well, then you didn't have enough money to buy the wagon and all the supplies and and all of those things. So it was the middle class who were doing this journey um, up until I say 1849, and and from it so you know the the very early earliest in the 1842 1843. Um, also, the other thing I did want to so 1847 was when the Mormons went, and I wanted to avoid that. I didn't want to get mixed up in the Mormon story because then that was a, just a yet another piece of history I would have to try to get right. <laughs> With <laughs> so yeah, so that's those are the sorts of factors which I was bringing in. Well, it does sound kind of fun to try and figure out what those realities were. 
Well, let's uh, talk to Angie. Uh, and so Imogen mentioned she's, you know, a British woman writing about this American West. You are First Nations from Canada writing about the American West. Uh, what do you think the the value is of well, multiple perspectives of and even, you know, your perspective? And you even talked about trying to write in that gray area, not be black and white. Um, what what do you think you can add or did you do you add in this novel providing your perspective? I think we humanize what, you know, settling the West was like that was forcible relocation of the indigenous people and, out, you know, outright extermination. So the American government enacted a policy of extermination and that's genocide. And, you know, they kind of get up to it until they get up against the Apaches and they're so furious. They're like, oh, this isn't working. <laughs> so that's where the slaughtering of the settlers come in because the Apaches were like, you know what, you kill us. Like, we're going to meet you 10 times that. We're just going to kill anything that moves. And so there's this like huge, you know, fear now because there's these Indians like literally stalking them, but the deprivation was on both sides. And I think it's, and I think it's also, I, I remember, I think we spoke about this, like interracial marriage was huge and, and it had been going on for at least a hundred years by this point. So now we have, you know, mixed cultures, mixed technology. And what I found most interesting as a historian, when you start researching this is, you know, nine times out of 10, the white people would go live with the Indians, but the Indians wouldn't go live with the white people. And I, I, we talked about this. So with the Battle of Little Bighorn, what they do is they renege on the Fort Laramie Treaty. And you start looking into this and the American government broke every single treaty up to date with the Indians. They haven't honored one treaty. So they break this treaty. And when this is going on, they have what Custer bans, they call them squawmen. So they have, you know, white men that have married indigenous women that are trying to advocate like, no, don't sign this. Like you're, what you're doing is wrong. And they threw them out of the negotiations. So there is historical evidence that this is going on. And if you just start looking at the ethnographic picture and you see like a blonde Indian, you're like, nope. <laughs> and you see lots of that. So I think it's, you know, illustrating that it's not so cut and dry and where that fear came from and what that fear would have been like for the indigenous people. Because, you know, they were getting killed while they slept as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know, well said and well and very honest. And I think that's what his, you know, history needs is a little honesty like mm -hmm. that. And just a shameless plug here. You, you said we've talked about that. Well, for the you, you will appear on season six of History Through Fiction, the podcast, starting February nineteenth, weekly episodes. Uh, so if anyone wants to know oh, no. more more in depth <laughs> about what we talked about, that will that will be published at History Through Fiction, the podcast. Well, now I've messed up the timelines. <laughs> Turning into an Avengers movie. <laughs> that might make it more entertaining. Amanda, um, so you, uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit about black and white, good and evil, um, but we also, you kind of excavate this hidden history. You talk about um exposing the valor of people that that no one knows you know, about these amazing things that they did my question for you is how do you discover the valor of ordinary individuals uh, when there's not so much that's documented about them and then how do you go about doing your research and bringing that history forward i love that question that's such a great question so it really for me it comes down to the research it comes down into delving into the history for me I'm always fascinated not only by like the broad historical text but the memoirs the first-hand accounts the deeply personal experiences of individuals and that's where my best story ideas come from because those are you know those are the human stories I think it's so easy to relegate history to dates and facts but it's the stories of the humanity the lives touched that are just so extraordinarily compelling and those are what I love to uncover and to illuminate and for me, I was also really privileged with this novel to be able to access a lot of um, interviews that had been done with veterans of the Warsaw Uprising and people who were fought in the Polish resistance and listening to those was really very, very moving hearing in their own words what they lived through, what they experienced. Um, 
was just especially the, the stories of women, the stories of the women and the ways that they were soldiers, the ways that they served was just really, it was really powerful. Another really incredible um, experience during the, this research process was I was actually able to go to a place that was an archive that housed artifacts and documents related to the Polish underground. And so I was able to um, look at the, the newspapers that were printed and distributed illegally, look at um, the armbands that home army soldiers wore during the uprising and that the women would stitch in a helmet worn by a home army soldier. So those experiences really made the research process really tangible. It really made history not just like a shadowy black and white photograph, but this tangible world inhabited by human beings not so very different from ourselves. And so moments like those, that's really where the heart of the story emerges and the moments that I'm most inspired by. That's so amazing that you're able to see those ta tangible elements. How did they make you feel and were you able to like transfer those feelings into your writing? They left me deeply moved, um, looking at, you know, personal, some personal items there as well, you know, personal items that the women would have, they carried with them as they were fighting. It just really reminded me of their humanity. It gave me a deeper empathy. I think sometimes it's really easy to be detached. Um, you know, as we research and we research, we can almost become detached or desensitized from the material, but seeing those human elements just brought back the truth of what I was doing, the truth in the heart of the story. And so it was deeply moving and really had a deep impact on the novel that's just that's great uh selena let's go back to you uh you are coming to us from austin texas and i don't know i just expected you to say i'm from boston or something uh because you, <laughs> you, you, you write almost i've been to boston five times and i'm going <laughs> the end of february to speak about general well Green. why not just i also do there. presentations so. <laughs> so why the fascination with the american revolution uh, where did that where did that inspiration come from? It uh, honestly, I started when I was in sixth grade, and I learned the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And I don't remember. I, I remember wondering what all the fuss was really about, and I don't remember whether I went to my teacher or how. But I found out about the first shots that were fired of the Revolutionary War. Uh, in Lexington and Concord, and that's what Paul Revere was shouting about, was the British were coming out of Boston to uh, Lexington and Concord to look for ammunition in Samuel Adams and John Hancock. And uh, I always liked history. Uh, I knew something about the Revolutionary War. I knew about Washington. I uh, knew about John Adams. I knew about a few people. I knew that Washington crossed the Delaware River on Christmas night to attack Hessians. I didn't know what Hessians were at the time, but I just kind of kept that in my heart. And uh, when I got a chance to start writing, uh, I actually wrote about Victorian America first, but I switched to the revolution and sort of gave myself a master's degree in the American Revolution, writing four books, and then this book about General Green. And what was it like for you to uh, turn that fascination into a, a compelling narrative? Like, what were some of the, your lessons along the way in order to change that history so that it was palatable and engaging for readers? That That's a good question. I uh, came across a lot of letters and primary resources that uh, are available online and in libraries. And I took a lot of those letters and put them, for instance, Nathaniel Green was a prolific, pedantic writer. He was a major general. He, there's like 10 volumes of his papers that are primary resources and also people that wrote to him. And I took those letters and made them into conversations because this is really what they were saying to each other in these letters when they're writing to each other. He's writing to Washington. Washington's writing to him. Nathaniel Green's writing to his wife. Soldiers are writing to each other. And I took that opportunity to say, this is how they were talking to each other through letters. And I put them in the situations they were in, in real life, the battles, the deprivation of the Continental Army. And so I was able to shape it into 
where I felt like these men and these women were were saying to one another and doing at the at the time. Yeah, it must be really interesting to be able to see their words on paper and then bring them to life in a novel. Yes, very much so. It's very exciting. Imogen, uh, I talked to Selena a little bit about her inspiration. Uh, I read or saw, I don't know, somewhere that you took a cross-country trip from, was it New York to San Francisco? <laughs> Tell me about that trip and how it inspired you to follow the career path you've followed. <laughs> it was actually, it was the, the other way, the other way around. Well, I, actually it was, um, so I was 19 and I had a job in Maryland. What, I called it Maryland um, until my American friends taught me how to pronounce it properly. And um, and after I finished, so I worked there for summer and after I'd finished, I just went and visited my various American friends. So I went up to, so, and it was mostly it was sort of by Amtrak or by, by, by bus. So, was, um, so I went up to, Chicago. I then went across. I did. I went. I stayed in Minneapolis, St. Paul, which I think is where you are. So I went across there, and then we went across to uh, Vancouver Island. Um, you know, to, to stayed in Victoria and um, uh, in British Columbia, and then back down to Seattle, and then took the the Pacific Coast Highway by bus down to San Francisco. Stayed with a friend a bit there. It stayed in a very dodgy hotel, actually. Um, and then that was when I took then they took the bus right the way across from San Francisco to New York. And that was a, that's a three day bus ride, um, and and the and it and it's one of those formative experiences. And, um, I mean, I had breaks in some of that, obviously, up until the San Francisco to New York, I was having breaks. But um, it's to do with it was to do with the landscape because obviously you're sitting and staring out of the window for a, a lot of time and it's you just get the sense of the scale of it particularly if you've come from britain where in britain if you're traveling anywhere by car um if you fall asleep for just 10 minutes if, when you open your eyes the landscape is different in most of britain really it, it changes all the time um whereas in you know if you <laughs> on the bus yeah you could fall asleep for three hours and you wake up look out and if it was identical because everything was just so big um you know the planes just went on forever um and then it was the people and again my my american friends warned me about the sort of people i would meet because they said you know regular americans they fly um and i was just meeting these fascinating people and and aware that the sort of people who take the greyhound are are just i don't know just different from well, or the ones who would fly everywhere. Um, and it was sort of just gave me this absolute love for the country and for the people I was meeting. And so that's that's where it started. And that was where some of that whole idea of these big journeys and these big treks sort of came from. Sorry, I just went on a bit there, sort of waxing lyrical. I get all excited when I remember it. That's okay. <laughs> I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that idea of scale. You talked about coming mm -hmm. from England, a, a relatively small island in, when compared to the North American continent. Um, but then you also say, you know, it took you three days. But then in your novel, of course, mm -hmm. you're talking about people that went on, uh, they walked across the, the country. And and I can actually relate to that a, a little bit. I walked 2,000 miles on the Pacific Crest Trail. And wow. uh, so that's a whole nother scale. So how were you able to kind of put yourself into the the frame of mind of your characters and just the, the, the like, I can't imagine how long, they, they would have been not just three hours of seeing the same landscape, but maybe three <laughs> months. What, how are you able to put yourself in that mindset? Yeah, and, and sometimes, um, the camps they would sort of sometimes they they would camp and they would actually get to the next day's camp and look back and they could still see where they where they camped the day before it was sort of like you know so which must have been pretty depressing really but the real challenge was actually to do with the story how did I how was I going to create you know so which is fundamentally a love story with that journey with the time it took so it was how to um, so I think that's how I did in terms of the, the the scale. It was actually to do with how is the relationship developing, um, what happens where. So um, having a I suppose a crisis point connected to Fort Laramie, for example, and uh, and and actually 
connecting up uh, at a sort of a much more beautiful time when they got to a, a place called um, Bear, Bear Valley with the Bear River, which was a, which is just, you know, was actually fertile and lots of trees and, you know, it was really lovely. And that's where I put the scene of, you know, those positive scenes. So I think, I don't know if that says at all. So I think it was to do with trying to bring together the story and the relationship, yeah, you know, where the relationship was with the the landscape. It does mean there are little bits where I cheat, but you know. So <laughs> yeah. So that's that's I don't know if that answers it, but that's what I was trying to achieve. No, certainly it's kind of interesting to hear that the timeline is what is what you had to kind of figure out as far as characters and what they're doing and when. Uh, well, I've got a few more questions for our panelists, uh, but I will get to questions from the audience. So if you have some questions, go ahead and start posting those in the chat and I can get to those in a little bit. I'm going to repost the link to our panelists books now that everyone knows what they're about a little bit. Maybe you're interested in picking one up um, so you can get there's the link there in the chat. Uh, Angie, let's go back to you. We have talked about the Battle of the Little Bighorn. We haven't talked much of the historical context of the 1970s timeline in your novel. Um, can you tell us what was going on um, at that time with the American Indian movement and, and some of the historical elements of that part of your timeline? Well, that's a pretty spicy point of uh, history, isn't it? We got the Vietnam War, we have JFK, we have Martin Luther King. And we have, um, so we have the Black Civil Rights Movement and what kind of comes out of that as well as the American Indian Movement. And so the American Indian Movement, you know, they're like, whoa, like reservations, these are prison camps, like what's going on? You've broken every treaty, like how do we, how do we ratify this? Like why, like there's, there's a lot of racism that exists, not everywhere, but there's like little pockets of it, which of course get like exasperated in the media and, uh, so in, in regards to the Vietnam War, we have like a strong military history, indigenous people, and almost all Indians that went to the Vietnam War volunteered, they weren't conscripted. So I wanted to tie that in. I, I, I come from armed forces, my family, and um, like to me, that's sort of interesting, right? Because here we have, you know, this government that tried to slaughter us and now, you know, it's honorable to fight for them. And that's, you know, I've I've been raised with that. And I, I believe that like we're all one, like you can't you can't hate somebody for something that happened in the past, but you have to try to, you know, rectify and heal those mistakes. And so the 1970s, you know, they, we have Wounded Knee. So the federal government stands off on the same, the exact same spot as the little big one with the same indigenous people. And so we're kind of leading, you know, there's like tension leading up to that. And like, that, that just blew my mind too. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> like here we have like multiple battles all in one spot, right? Can you talk a little bit how you use your characters to connect those two histories? Oh, you know, I, what, I, I'm trained in archival research. So I go through and I archival research what I write. It usually takes, you know, probably about six months. And then I pick out all the facts that I think are pertinent. And then I start to weave them together and build, you know, um, very individual experience around that. And so you can see, like, I, I kind of follow like a three act, you know, format. So the first, you know, you're kind of leading up to like the second act where all the action is. So we kind of see, you know, both battles going on at once. We see like Nancy, who's in the 1970s, kind of coming to the height of tensions in her community, along with Little Wolf, who's had to, you know, who had been forced into the battle of Little Bighorn. No, that, that I think mm -hmm. that's, that's great. And um, it's interesting for, you know, for all of your backgrounds, you're all so well trained in doing research. Um, I don't think people quite understand the craft that's involved and then bringing that archival research into a well-crafted story. So I think that's really great that you're able to do that. It's just such an incredible medium to connect people, you know, with history, because, you know, when you do, when you are trained as a historian and you work your way through university, like the classes get smaller and smaller, like you're in a room with like six other people. And so you're not getting exposed to these ideas and different, you know, historical knowledge. 
Well, Amanda, I want to go back mm. to you. Uh, your stories kind of represent good versus evil, but your characters don't. They're a lot more well-rounded. Your heroes have flaws. Your villains have some uh, redeeming qualities. Uh, talk about even in a world where, where we, we can easily see black and white, good and evil, you have these fully rounded characters. Well, for me, it always really comes down to delving into their humanity and delving into who they are as individuals. I think all of us at some point in our lives have probably been heroes in some relationships and villains in others. And so I think that that's something I return to that we all are very nuanced people. My characters, my two sisters in the novel, they experience a rift in their relationship and in the midst of doing these very heroic acts for the resistance. So in the midst of, you know, being what we would call heroes and indeed they were, you know, there's also this brokenness in their relationship as sisters. And so I think just picking out those nuances and just realizing, you know, that these that their humanity even in the midst of their heroism. So that's something that I always return to. Yeah, well said. I think we can all see it within our own families. I know I can, you know, depending on the dynamics. Well, I'm going to go to some questions here that we have from our audience. Um, so if you if you are in our audience and you have some questions, go ahead and, and post those in the chat. Uh, Greg Sanford asks, do you work from the history to the story or find the story and study the history? Uh, so which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Who wants to jump on that one? Go ahead. Can I, can I just say, I have actually, this is so strange. I have just written a blog post where I actually use the phrase, which I'm <laughs> chicken or egg story. Uh, story on, so I'm just finding that quite a weird moment. So, uh, and, and my conclusion, by the way, for me personally, is actually I start with the characters. So for me, it's the characters first um, and falling in love with them. And then for me, it's the story and only after that, it's then the history um and i do have i have a question to ask the others but uh, yeah i could always which sort of relates to that but i'll maybe i could ask that afterwards give other people a chance to answer the first oh, one sure does anyone disagree with imogen yeah, I, I worked from oh. yeah, yeah i was <laughs> go gonna ahead. say i'm the total opposite i go from history <laughs> to too. characters yeah yeah, yeah. Well, not to outvote you, but I do the same thing. And <laughs> I also start with the history. But um, I think it kind of depends on the kind of story you're you're trying to write and where your interests lie, and and if it's going to be more literary or more historical, and and all those sorts of things. But either way, they ultimately become totally intertwined in the end. So what what question do you have? Did you have Imogen? Oh well, well, it probably as a result of how I do it, <laughs> is then what happens when things don't quite fit. So <laughs> just I mean, it's just so it's just a small thing. But so I talked about the year I wanted to. to I had really strong reasons for having my my story set in in eighteen forty six. Absolutely didn't want it any earlier. Didn't want it any later. Um, but at that stage, Fort Laramie was called uh, Fort John. Um, it wasn't called Fort Laramie until like, I think it was a year later. And I was sort of struggling. I was thinking, oh, do I call it Fort John? Or do I? And I was thinking, uh, nobody would be able to picture it because people have heard of Laramie and I think have a picture in their heads. And so I've called it Fort Laramie, even though strictly speaking, and if there was a real expert, they go, oh, rah, rah, rah. Um, so I don't know if anybody else, whether uh, whether somebody else would have taken a different decision there and would have stuck to the facts properly, whereas I've been a bit, you know, I I twisted, yeah, I let that one go. Don't know whether that's anybody a, else has come up with point. that. Uh, she has a good point. Uh, there's a one of the first battles of the Revolutionary War was uh, called the Battle of Bunker Hill. And actually, they the redoubt they were fighting in was on Breed's Hill. If you've ever been to Boston, there's a whole, uh, a whole monument there. So do you call it the Battle of Bunker Hill? That's popularly known as that. But they were actually on Breed's Hill. So MG has a good point about things being named or called something different, especially later on uh, after the war or you know the time period was over. For me, I, the Laramie just makes me think of the cigarettes from The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> I go with Fort Laramie as well. Like every time I think of it, like I can't picture the fort. I just see those cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. 
I, I kind of think you made the right decision there. That is, that is a difficult thing to weigh, um, especially, yeah, when you, you, you don't want to misrepresent the history, but I think ultimately that's, that's going to just be more relatable and it's going to serve your story a lot more than having to explain it every time. Oh, by the way, Fort Laramie was originally called Fort John. I mean, I think you can, that's something you can just easily handle in your, your author's note. And, and, and I think most readers will forgive you. But we all, you know, there's always that line. Where where do you cross that line? Yeah. Well, let's go to uh, Melissa's question. What do you hope readers take away from your book? So as we, you know, we spend so much time, you spend so much time writing these these stories. Um, ultimately, every reader is going to take away something different depending on their perspective. But I, you know, we're all trying to lead them to a certain feeling or conclusion. So, uh, Amanda, how about you? Where Where do you want readers, what do you want readers to take away from your book? I always hope that readers are inspired by the stories of ordinary people who refuse to be silent, who took action even at the risks or even the sacrifices of their lives. I think that even the simplest acts and the smallest acts can leave an indelible legacy. And I see that in countless times again and again in researching these true stories of these small acts that just made a deep imprint on someone's life. And so I really hope readers are inspired. I hope they're uplifted. And I also hope that my novel is set during World War II really maybe encourages them to delve deeper into the history. It's so important that stories of the war and stories of the Holocaust not be forgotten. And I think as more and more World War II veterans and Holocaust survivors pass each year, the importance of just keeping their stories alive, preserving them and passing them on to the next generation becomes just so much more imperative. And so that's really something. And I write from a heart from that. I think it's great to provide hope for people, hope for humanity amongst all the bad news that we see every day. Anyone else want to chime in on that, on on what you want your readers to take away? Um, I'd like to. I, I kind of agree with Amanda. Um, I want the readers to know that your average person uh, fought the American Revolution. Most of these people, a lot of these people were not uh, educated General Nathaniel Green was a self-educated Quaker from Rhode Island. He owned an iron, his family owned an iron forge and he was a iron forge worker. He pounded smelt and anchors and um, he, he was self-educated, taught himself military laws and strategy and the enlightenment was going on then. And so there was a lot of reading of human theory and civil society and and people sacrificed themselves for the American cause of liberty. And Nathaniel Green didn't go home for eight years, neither did George Washington. Uh, they suffered. They often had no shoes, no clothes, no food. And yet they still stuck with their cause and what they believed and what they were doing. And I want people to see that these people, that these generals were people. This is why uh, Nathaniel Green's wife, Katie, has her own point of view. She was a person. He was a person. They were married. They had children. They had all these things on the line. And she sacrificed as much as he did. So I want people to see the human element of what happened during the American Revolution and not just this big thing about battles and, and politics. Such a great message, and and I think even more valuable as we do head into the the election here in the United States, and gives us a good historical perspective of where we've come from. I think um, I've got another question from Jen. For all the writers, are there any eras besides the ones in the books that interest you for writing about? So all, most of you, it seems to kind of hone in on a certain subject matter. Are you interested in kind of uh, getting outside of that subject matter? The first novel I wrote was a backwards retelling of King Arthur and people hated it. Like it seemed to like really <laughs> rub them the wrong way. <laughs> and it was massive. I went like, you know, Lord of the Rings. So yeah, maybe <laughs> I'm really open to anything. <laughs> yeah, the first novel I wrote was actually uh, in the 1870s, uh, early 1870s and uh, 
they the family that was in that novel actually did uh, uh, take the Oregon Trail from the Saint from St. Louis to uh, Oregon and settled there. And so uh, I wrote about that time period. Um, I really did enjoy it a lot, but I just kind of got away from it. Um, I also wrote another novel set in 1869 in Maine. So uh, I don't know why I kind of got away from that time period, uh, but I still I still enjoy talking about it. That's interesting because my first novel was set in in 1874. Um, and and then uh, starts in Missouri and ends up in in Boston actually. So and it's sort of just trying to get that moment when America was moving from an in, uh, agricultural economy to an industrial economy, and I was I was very interested in 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 that aspect. But um, I I have sent my you say about things are different. So I have sent my editor uh, what. Um, what we in my writing group laughingly called my my bonkers bonking book, which is completely different. It's contemporary. It's it's. I will be extremely surprised if Storm, which is my publisher, went for it. I, if they did, I would also have to change my writing name. So uh, the answer is yes. I have all sorts of books in my head. I want to get out there, <laughs> but yeah, um, wouldn't want to shock my readers by taking them somewhere completely different um if they were expecting um a certain sort of book it's it's not a backwards <laughs> retelling of king arthur is it <laughs> like, I, also sounds good though <laughs> uh, i've got a question from jen she asks how do you achieve balance between real historical details and what for me are interesting research rabbit holes with creating fictional a uh, fictional world. So do you find yourself down a research rabbit hole? Do you have to kind of pull yourselves away from that? Oh, big time. You got to know when like, okay, you've got enough information here. Like what, what, what are you actually writing? And I think like if when you're working in historical fiction, you have to ask yourself why, like, why is this important? Like why, or, or else, yeah, you just have everything in there. <laughs> And do you find yeah. yourself putting in too much in a first draft and having to pull back? Um, you know, I rewrite probably about six times before I get to my final thing. So maybe, but I, I, I haven't found that yet unless you're working with King Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I way overwrite yeah. my first draft. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I have to cut 50,000 words out of, out of it because... I get overly excited about everything and I realize, no, this is exciting to me, but does, you know, does the reader really care and it doesn't really make the story better. And it's a hard decision. I, I think for all authors of any genre to know when to cut it off and, and to tighten things down so that it, it makes for a better moving story. I, I think Selena is so right there. I mean, uh, for me, my my first draft is is fairly tight. Um, it's actually the I know the second, third, and fourth are the ones where I get too much information in, and then uh, as you say, it, it's uh, not fifty and fifty thousand words. Thank God, so far anyway. Uh, but definitely, um, it, oh, again, things which I've got all excited about and think is really interesting, uh, but which just isn't moving the story. And I think it, the challenge isn't, isn't the challenge that you're trying to create a sense of place and something which is authentic um, and really give, give enough for the reader to feel like they're there, but not so much that they feel like they're, because this is, as you say, this is fiction. So we don't want them thinking they're reading a history textbook, they're reading fiction. But yeah, so so you're right. It's a difficult balance, and I suppose it's when the editor is really helpful. <laughs> We've got about five minutes left in our event. I have one more question for each of you to answer. Before I get to that, we did get a, a question from G. Spencer. Um, maybe you could just answer quickly about whether you use an outline or not. Um, some authors do, some authors don't. Where are you on using an outline? Uh, Amanda, could you start us off? 
So yes, I do use an outline I always will write. It's more of a synopsis of sorts that's very long and just includes everything that I think that I want to put in the story. But then it always ends up changing. The story will evolve um, as I continue to research. And so, it, so looking back on that outline when I'm holding the finished book in my hands, there definitely is that skeleton that remains the same, but so many of the, there are so many detours along the way. Anyone else thoughts on outline, no outline? How yeah. much do you stick to it? Um, I I definitely do. But actually, my my process is to have written the story in my head in incredible detail over many months, and it is literally just sitting there. And so then when it comes to the outline, that happens really quite quickly. I can just get it straight out. Um, and and it's a long, you know, it'll be a, it's not a synopsis. It's like 30, 3,000 words at least. Um, but it happens very easily because it's the outlining happens here. But then after that, obviously, more and more work, lots and lots of drafts, and it grows and changes from there. I actually have my original outline here. Do you want me to show it? Of course. Oh, yes. Wow. And I, so I just keep on referring back to that as I write. <laughs> I think an outline is supposed to be organized, Angie. <laughs> <laughs> it is. That's what the inside of my brain looks like. <laughs> you should frame that and put it up on the wall. <laughs> well, um, I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank our um, audience so much for being a part of this. This was a really wonderful conversation the recording will be available on our Facebook page within minutes. I will also put the recording up on our YouTube channel and on our member only um, area of History Through Fiction's website. Um, so thanks again so much to everyone. But before we go, I always ask our panelists, well, I also wanna congratulate you on your novels. It's an amazing accomplishment and you should all be very proud. And I'm so glad I got to talk to you about those novels. Um, but I always ask, why historical fiction? That's what that we're promoting here. That's what we publish at History Through Fiction. What is the value of taking this history and bringing it to life through fiction? Uh, Selena, do you want to start us out? Uh, the, I think the value is that, uh, you know, you can pick up a nonfiction book and read about, in my case, the American Revolution or any of the, the authors uh, I'm sure that you can pick up a nonfiction book about Custer and, uh, but the thing about writing historical fiction is that you can give that nonfiction, you can say how it felt. Nonfiction says, this is what happened. Historical fiction says, this is how it felt. This is how the people felt. And I think that's the value of it when it's written well and you put a lot of effort into it. Uh, you get the feeling of how of being there, of how it was. At least yeah. for me, that's how I feel. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Amanda, what do you think? I would totally echo everything Selena said. I think story has this powerful capacity to create empathy. It has the power to infuse humanity into what may often seem, you know, reading reading in your high school textbook, what may seem dry. When you read it in a novel, it comes alive. It puts flesh and bones on, you know, on people and, and just reminds us of this, just of their humanity. And so I think that's really powerful. Thank you, Amanda. Mm -hmm. uh, Imogen, do you have anything you can add to that? Yeah, I, I think those are both such great answers. I, I think that we um, it, it makes it more vivid. And we are naturally, as a, as a species, humans are storytellers. I think we've been telling stories for millennia. We sit around fires, and that's what we do. And so it's tapping into that, that for me. And Angie, what are your thoughts on the value of historical fiction? Why why did you spend so many years bringing this your story to life through fiction? Yeah, I think it's, it, it echoes the same reason as the three other authors. It's the interconnectedness of the human soul. And that race is an illusion. And the only thing that will ever matter is love. So it's giving, you know, a story to that. Very well said. Well, thanks again to, to everyone. Congratulations on your novels. And I hope you have a good rest of the evening or morning, wherever you might be. And thanks again so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.